Hey everyone, and welcome back to the series Question Everything, where we, as you guessed it, question everything. From psychology, to science, to who knows what else. But today's topic is the ego and prejudice. Now, Freud's personality theory is basically that the human psyche has more than one aspect. There are three main aspects of this theory that develop at different stages in life. The ID, the ego, and the superego. Question everything. Question everything, question everything, question everything, why? Disclaimer, I'm not an expert on these subjects I discuss in these videos. I only share information that I've personally done my research on or relaying an expert's message. My goal or intention with these videos is to cultivate understanding, awareness, and acknowledge real life issues that we as humans face. I do hold certain opinions about these subjects and so bias can play a role in the way information is shared. I would also like to acknowledge that the way we perceive the world individually can be vastly different from one another, and that's good. However, it's also good to look at things from another perspective when learning about reality, otherwise our biased views can become harmful. Question. What are these parts of the brain, and how do they interact with each other and influence an individual's behavior? Answer. The ID is said to be the primal or instinctual component. The superego is the conscience, and the ego is the mediator between the two. Keep in mind this is a theory, however, the image of an iceberg is used commonly to explain the levels of consciousness and the human psyche, where the ID and the majority of the superego would be under the water or unconscious, and the ego as the tip above or conscious, and the barrier between the two would be preconscious. This could also be imagined by a little devil and a little angel on your shoulders telling you what you want versus what you should do. The should in this oftentimes is an idolized or extreme version of oneself or conscience, and it is nearly impossible to achieve due to humans being flawed. Perfection doesn't exist objectively, and holding ourselves up to that standard will lead inevitably to guilt or sadness. Guilt is a very common problem because of all the urges and drives coming from the ID and the prohibitions and codes of the superego. There are a variety of ways an individual handles guilt, and these are called defense mechanisms. Now, personally, I don't like that they called guilt a problem, as it means we would exhibit a level of empathy, and that can influence us to correct our actions when possible. At the end of the day, guilt is simply a feeling, and we as humans experience feelings in many different and intricate ways. You could say that these feelings are what give us our humanity. So I think often, not always, but often. Childhood trauma gives kids a bigger guilt complex, so they end up apologizing for practically everything, even things they don't need to. This creates problems because being able to genuinely apologize requires empathy, however, the main cause of doing this too much is the result of anxiety. Whether this be their superego telling them to live up to their parents' or society's expectations, yet never feeling good enough, or their personal desires being denied by the same thing, both result in low self-esteem and feelings of inadequacy. Children can often be guilted into denying their own feelings or identity, so they end up asking, what's wrong with me? Why can't I insert impossible to achieve expectation here? Constantly being forced to question your reality is not only the goal of common abuse tactic gaslighting, but it undermines the individual's ability for self-advocation. This is how stereotypes like women are too crazy or emotional can lead to misogynists or just shitty people constantly invalidating and degrading women, yet they are ultimately the ones who end up apologizing after being verbally, emotionally, and mentally abused. If these minorities aren't able to have a voice, it's much easier to walk over them, or anyone for that matter. It's how abuse has persisted for long periods of time by causing one to feel invalid or questioning their own worth or credibility, e.g. slavery, misogyny. So where does prejudice come from? To break it down, we need to start with the base feelings that cause one to behave poorly towards certain minorities or people. Defense mechanisms are psychological strategies that are unconsciously used to protect a person from anxiety arising from unacceptable thoughts or feelings. These can be rejection, denial, projection, regression, and sublimation. Some of these, as you might recall from my previous episode on cognitive dissonance, follow the conflicting thoughts or feelings. When in an uncomfortable situation, feeling intimidated by a person or situation, or a real or perceived attack, your mind subconsciously puts up these defenses. We typically use anger to mask our sadness, grief, or other feelings we find uncomfortable. This is not only easier for our brains, but also paired with these defense mechanisms can make it even more difficult to respond in a healthy manner. That is why having access to not only therapy, but knowledge about all of this is vital for the healing of global trauma that we've gone through. Just because you're not currently able to cope with what you're dealing with or have dealt with doesn't mean that you're not able to learn or do so in the future. You aren't unforgivable. It's time for a mindful moment. We can take a moment to check in with ourselves. Stop generalizing men. 
Why? Generalizations are a normal part of conversation, especially when talking about social studies. No, they're bad. Do you use the word everyone? Yes. That's a generalization. Have you ever said my coworkers or my classmates? Yes. That's a generalization. Do history books describe entire groups of people and their cultural beliefs? Yes. That's a generalization. Do you ever say or support people who say men are more logical or men built the world today and we wouldn't be anywhere without them? Yes. Those are generalizations and they're generalizations about men, but you don't have a problem with those. Why? I guess because they're positive. Yes, have you ever said or supported people who say women are bad drivers? Yeah, that is a stereotype because one, it's not true, and two, it's at the expense of a minority group, meaning there could be negative systemic outcomes because of that stereotype. What? In many states, women have to pay more for car insurance than men, even though they get into fewer accidents and they make up about half the drivers on the road. Do you see the difference in a generalization versus a stereotype? I guess. If women discussing men's significantly high tendencies to harass, assault, and murder women was a stereotype, and it did cause systemic oppression, one, it wouldn't be true, which it is. And two, you'd see systemic oppression for men, like a curfew every night, less seats in government, or a mandatory therapist. Hmm. Feminine presenting people talking about these harmful behaviors that men often exhibit is one, for our own safety, and two, to ask men to acknowledge these issues. Instead of listening to what millions of women have to go through at the hands of men, millions of you decided that suddenly generalizing was a bad thing. Not all men. Not me. Not my problem. You tried to snuff out an entire movement about the liberation of feminine presenting people by making men the victims. Enough. Listen to the behaviors women are not comfortable with. Avoid the behaviors. Stop letting others do those behaviors. That's it. But what about men's problems? There are spaces to discuss those things, but this space is for feminine presenting people and their problems. Racism is not systemic. Check the dictionary. Oh, okay, I have that right here. It says, um, the systemic oppression of a racial group to the social, economic, and political advantage of another. And then it specifically mentions white supremacy. No, but I don't like that one. Why? It's the most recently updated version. Why wouldn't we want to use the most up-to-date version? I don't want to use the most up-to-date version. I want to use the version that allows me to escape the accountability I might otherwise feel for the hundreds of years that people who look like me have brutalized and colonized and enslaved people of color. But the updated definition was created in tandem with scholars and experts in the field of race. They're radical leftists. Miriam Webster. Look, I don't actually care what the dictionary says, okay? If only white people can experience racism, then it might be the responsibility of white people to get rid of racism. Yes, it is white people's responsibility to get rid of racism because white people made racism. What are you talking about? That's a conversation for a different video. White supremacy is actually more destructive than misogyny. But it's the same thing. What? I think you're trying to say that racism is worse than sexism, but really it's all two sides of the same coin. So about 500 years ago, a group of white supremacists came up with this system that we have now. We'll call this system level zero. And then they cared about domination, control, and power. We will call that level one. And the way in which they maintain their domination, control, and power is via patriarchy, racism, capitalism, ableism, and a couple of other things I'm probably forgetting right now, and we will call that level two. And then underneath level two, we have level three, which are usually the things that we complain about, and we're all familiar with these things, I hope. So when we have discussions such as pets over people, but casual racism isn't a big deal. We need black liberation, but keep the gays away from me. Racism doesn't exist. I'm poor and I'm white. We're actually just slowing ourselves down because we're all victims of the same system. But some of us can be hit by different sides of level two, hence intersectionality. Yeah, but if it wasn't for the colonizers that made this white supremacist world, we wouldn't be civilized. We'd be running around naked in huts somewhere. So that's actually a colonizer conversation, which I'm not going to get into. Therefore, I'm not going to even remind you about... The Mali Empire, which had a university with a library that had over 700,000 manuscripts. The Kingdom of Kush in South Sudan. And like, how do you forget about Egypt? Egyptians were white though. Okay, let's put in our critical thinking caps. Do you really think that in 3000 BC, people that were in this part of the world were white? <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't even spend more than 15 minutes outside without getting a sunburn, so that does make sense. And we probably would have been happier in huts. But either way, the current system doesn't work. But if this system is so bad, how come we're using it? Because the people that made this system weren't smarter than anyone. They were just more violent. 
Knowledge is power, and it can be abused, destroyed, or withheld, but also empowering, healing, and uplifting. Take any sort of discrimination, for instance, and ask why. White supremacy, to feel superior to BIPOC. Misogyny, to feel superior to women. As for homophobia, much like any other discrimination, there are several layers behind the why, and the main one is religious beliefs that could easily be countered with the application of research. Add on that hate typically stems from the lack of understanding of a subject or individual different from the norm or what we're used to. We don't have time to delve into each of these issues in detail, however it will get a separate video. So to reiterate, not understanding someone, something, or the unknown can make someone feel uncomfortable. Whether that be due to a personal trauma response being triggered, or those feelings of inadequacy or humiliation, it can lead to subconscious defense mechanisms being activated. People also hate when they feel powerless. Rather than turning their anxiety and shame inward, they may project that negativity onto an external target. That external target is typically minority groups. However, that's not to say that others don't experience prejudice. Which is important because we've all heard the saying, assuming does what? Makes an ass out of you and me. The usual response to bringing up the suffering of a minority from the majority is to minimize their experience and make it about them. For example, a woman says to a man, it's incredibly difficult being a woman, and the man would defensively respond with, it's hard being a guy too. Now, the woman was simply stating a fact. However, the man in the scenario perceived it as saying that men don't experience hardships, which again is intended to brush off any accountability or acknowledgement of the said issue. Their ego feels hurt and defense mechanisms pop up because of self-preservation. However, Caterpillar doesn't stay that way forever and we all must grow and change. There's a lot about this and I'll touch more on, but I think we'll save it for the next episode. And a final message, everyone is capable of prejudice. Whether it be good or bad doesn't make it right or true. Also, if you haven't tried therapy or self-reflection, perhaps now is the time. We as a human species have a lot more in common than we think. And because we're so focused and divided on all the things that make us different, it's hard It's hard to find common ground. But it's there. But that is all for today's video. I really hope you enjoyed. Uh, again, I'm really trying to do my best to make it palatable for anyone to watch. However, honestly, the main reason why I am creating this is just to have an outlet for my anger. Because I have empathy. And I really wish that the majority of human beings on this planet would exhibit that when talking or understanding or anything. This, this video specifically, this subject, is very important. And so I'm just kind of saying, hey, you're a human. I'm a human. Aren't we all? So therefore, why aren't we treating each other with respect? I'm this thing, and I'm this thing, which means I'm better than that thing. It's a very us versus them mentality, and we need to be... A us mentality, like, like a globally we are united, isn't it called the United States? Why are we divided states then? Just saying, food for thought. Seems like America is built on a lot of contradictions and we want to protect those and that causes a lot of mental gymnastics and cognitive dissonance. But I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're new, I would encourage you to click that subscribe button down below. And you can also check out any of my other videos by clicking over here. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you guys stay tuned for next episode. And that's all. So have a fan-freaking-tastic day. And don't forget to question everything.